<laughs> Arian Gulick works with numbers by day and words by night. He's a good man and thorough. Actually, you know what? I should do the Big Lebowski voice again, right? Yeah. Arian Gulick works with numbers by day and words by night. He's a good man and thorough, although he does wonder if the cable ever got fixed. You can follow him at, at Torpid House Ape on Instagram if you like looking at pictures of cute puppies and food. I think that's the first time that anybody has ever encouraged someone to follow someone in, on Instagram in that voice. So please, <laughs> applaud both Aaron and the trailer for The Big Lebowski again! The year is 1997, and Joel and Ethan Cohen have finally made it big in Hollywood. They've just won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, and the star of their movie, Frances McDormand, and wife of lucky bastard Joel Cohen, won for Best Actress, with Fargo also being nominated for Best Picture and Director. The world is their oyster, which of course is why they decide to follow up their critically acclaimed Midwestern murder mystery with a bowling noir starring Flynn from Tron and Dan from Roseanne. <laughs> now I know it may be hard to believe in today's world where the film is a cultural phenomenon. You've got your Lebowski Fest, the movie being added to the National Film Registry. The film's got fucking papers now, man. <laughs> Card-carrying dudist priests. Idiots in replica dude sweater, sweaters spewing quotes. But the movie actually opened to mixed reviews. Yeah, I know. Who are these assholes? <laughs> Fortunately, the internet is forever, so we can call these reactionaries out. Ken Fox of TV Guide says, What a strange reversal of fortune. Two years after Joel and Ethan Cohen delivered Fargo, the film that will probably stand as the filmmaker's finest moment, comes a long-awaited follow-up, and it's without question their worst. <sighs> yeah, well, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> Although... To be fair to Ken, he wrote that before Intolerable Cruelty and the Lady Killers existed. But fucking still. The improbably named Widget Walls of NeedCoffee.com somehow finding himself on Rotten Tomatoes had this to say in awarding the film a score of 0 out of 5. Bridges meanders through the film with little oomph, his partner Goodman trying his best to be interesting even when the material isn't. Buscemi is ultimately wasted as the third member of the Bridges Goodman bowling team since all he's there for is to be told to shut up. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, Widget Walls. <laughs> Let's talk about cursing for a minute. By some counts, there are as many as 290 glorious fucks in this movie. And there are all different kinds. You've got your shut the fuck up Donnies, your fucking travesties about Vietnam, fucking nihilists, fucking amateurs, wondering what the fuck people are talking about, basically every third word out of Jesus' mouth, peeing on the dude's fucking rug, and of course, what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass. <laughs> this is what happens, Larry. Side note to the side note, the cable edit of that is basically the best thing of all time ever. This is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> guilty, guilty admission time, guys. I didn't love this movie the first time I saw it either. I mean, I enjoyed it. It's a Coen Brothers movie. It's kind of like pizza or sex, even when it's not, you know, awesome. You still just ate pizza or had sex. <laughs> So you got that going for you. But yeah, the first time I saw this movie in the theater, my reaction was also along the lines of, they're going to follow Fargo up with this? What the hell? <laughs> Fortunately, just like pizza or sex, there's no such thing as too much Big Lebowski. And if you disagree, you're probably into eight-year-olds. With repeated viewings... <laughs> With repeated viewings, I have come to appreciate the film's special genius. There's a lot of ins, a lot of outs, a lot of what have yous. After seeing it twice, it grew on me. After three viewings, I was abiding, and by the fourth time I saw it, I was quite possibly the laziest man in all of Georgia, <laughs> which, as we know, puts me high in the running for laziest worldwide. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure we all love The Big Lebowski, because A, we're at a show about the Coen brothers, for fuck's sakes. B, the alternative is being into eight-year-olds. But the movie <laughs> and the dude both hold special places in my life. I can watch the movie at any time and have to the prob probably to the tune of 30-something viewings and really enjoy it after a particularly shitty day, like when work has been especially awful or someone plays a fucking eagle song around me. <laughs> but the dude, man, the dude was, well, I don't want to say a hero 
because what's a hero anyway? <laughs> but the dude is and was the man who helped me find my path in this crazy world. His relaxed shuffle through life gave me a roadmap for what to do when times were bad. Put myself into the dude's jellies or bowling shoes and ask that all-important forward question, what would dude do? <laughs> He's been there for me, like some sort of stoned, half-conscious Tom Joad. <laughs> when, I walked, when I called into work one, one day and, with the excuse of being tired and I didn't get fired, the dude was there. <laughs> when my college roommates and I ate a bunch of acid and then went to a bowling alley one night because they were going to have cosmic bowling, all sorts of cool lights and shit, only to get there and find no lights and a bunch of angry rednecks <laughs> freaking us the fuck out, the dude was there for us. We managed to keep our shit together, bowl one game, and leave without freaking anybody out. <laughs> It would have been really cool if the dude had been there for me later, though, as I was coming down and became convinced that the only way I could possibly sleep was to unplug all the electrical appliances in my room, though. <laughs> that was not cool. <laughs> when I had to get a job last year, after finally graduating from school, I was on the 18-year plan. Don't judge. The dude was there again, helping me turn my part-time job into a full-time job, where I get to work exclusively from home, wearing pajamas, and I'll also get to keep growing this stupid beard. Thanks for getting me out of having to interview, dude. I'm terrible at that shit. And when I deleted all of my online dating profiles a couple months ago, confident that I would just sort of accidentally find a wealthy heiress <laughs> who wanted my help solving a mystery and helping her conceive, but didn't want to see me socially, <laughs> and the joke is on her because I'm pretty sure I shoot blanks, you can be damn sure the dude was there for that. So the dude has always been there for me, and that's great. That's far out, man. Sometimes, though, I worry about the younger generation's relationship with the dude. You millennials are stuck with this shitty economy where you constantly hustle multiple different ways to bring in money, all while graduating with a mountain of debt. What could you possibly learn from a lazy stoner with no job and a bowling habit? A lot. <laughs> you could learn a lot, you jerks. You need to slow down and enjoy the finer things in life. Find your inner dude. Fuck it, go bowling. Because he's the hero you need and deserve. Taking it easy for all you sinners out there. A slothful guardian, an oblivious protector, the dude. Thank you. Yeah.